Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Brown Car Guy and Buddies and today I'm going to be talking to a very good friend of mine Tim Ansel over in Dubai and I met him or I got to know him through his rallying antics and also I got to know him through uh, the press circuit because he also does motoring journalism as well as many many other things. One thing that is always guaranteed with him is that whenever we get together we always have a lot of laughs. He's absolutely hilarious but he's done some incredibly uh, amazing things including having a very serious injury at the desert challenge and also doing some precision stunt driving uh, and stuff like that for some Hollywood movies and I'm sure we're going to get into a lot of that as well as I think talking about Land Rovers he talks about Land Rovers a lot that's also going to be happening anyway this is going to be fun before we get into this make sure that you're subscribing to youtube.com forward slash brown car guy and also follow me on all the social media channels just search for hashtag brown car guy you can see it there on my hat that's on Instagram Twitter and Facebook and of course subscribe to browncarguy.com there it is on the screen behind me cool let's get into this hey Tim long time no Hello, see mate. how you doing I'm very well, Shazad. Good to see you, and uh, thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it. So, uh, managed how, to you, how have you been? How have you been in this lockdown situation? What's it been like over there in Dubai? Well, I mean, it, Dubai's handled it pretty well, I have to say. Uh, we went into lockdown at the end of March, early April, um, but because the industry that I'm in is, uh, we're supplying. We'll get to this, but I'm sure. But the food and food and beverage industry, um, our business had to continue. Uh, yeah, because of course, if we yeah. stop working, we don't supply the consumables for the machines and yeah. then the, the food delivery stop. So uh, although I was about three weeks working from home, after that, uh, the lockdown was released a little and I was being, I've been going into work every second day for months now. And about five weeks ago, started going every day. So, uh, so this is yeah. really confusing people right now because normally, like I, when I say, you know, brown car guy and buddies, and normally the buddies <laughs> that I'm talking to are people that are in some way related to either car journalism or the automotive industry or something. And there you've gone, yeah. off, gone off and started talking about food supplies and all that. What's that all about? Let's bring so it look, back take, to cars. Take, take a look behind me, right? Do you, yeah. do you think that I'm not related to cars in some way or airplanes? I, I can't. Um, I, I lo I'm loving the Audi Quattro behind your, your left shoulder there, but I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about that in a, in a while. But you and I got to meet on car launches and stuff like that when you were playing at being a journalist, if, I don't, if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> What's your man? Well, that was a very brief interview. Which is it was a pleasure and goodbye. Yeah, yeah there you go. Do the whole um, getting up and walking off. And <laughs> could do, could do. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, I, you had a, a guy from the States a couple of weeks ago, and he said, yeah. I don't think of myself as an automotive journalist. He said, I'm an automotive writer. Yeah, I was very and, humble of him. It was very humble of him. Yeah. He, he is one of America's uh, it, top writers. You know, uh, we're talking about Johnny Lieberman. Work, yeah. I, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but I would not compare myself to him. So yeah. I do consider myself an automotive writer. It's yeah. just something that I'm passionate about, that I was very lucky enough to fall into, let's be honest, um, yeah. the opportunity to write for a car magazine. Um, I'm not a journalist. I didn't have a journalistic background. I... Um, I trained as an aircraft engineer when I was a young man. We're going uh, to really come back to that. We're, we'll start. We'll start. Okay. We'll go back to the beginning and we'll start that. I just wanted to bring up yeah. the journalist thing just to reassure people that this is how I got to know you. And one, yeah, of the yeah, things yeah. I do know, one of the things I do know about you is that, well, and we'll come to this as well, I'm sure, that whatever, whenever we're on a press trip together, whatever car we take out on a drive, yes. whatever color it is to start with, it always ends up blue at the end of the uh, drive, doesn't it? And that's down to you. <laughs> is that the language? Are you... <laughs> no, that's so unfair. That's a... Goodness me. Well, uh, hang on, hang on. The last car we were drove together, I was swearing because you were driving off road, right? And I think anybody sat next to you <laughs> driving off road is probably going to be swearing. I, 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 in my defense. Yeah. That, Jeep, that, that Jeep Wrangler didn't stay red for very long, did it? That's... No, it was mostly brown on the outside, and my seat was certainly brown by the time you finished driving it. Uh, I'll tell you what, one of the things that I have to say that what I'm, what I'm alluding to is that we, we always have a lot of laughs whenever we're out together. Yeah. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. And you do absolutely yeah. keep me in stitches. So thank you very much for all the great time well, we've it's, together. It's mutual because it only works if you bounce off the other guy. So uh, thank you. It's definitely mutual. 
So you started, so you're a Land Rover guy. You mentioned off-roading there and you, because you, you sent me a little bio and you've got a Land Rover book over your, over your right shoulder there. And you yeah. said you, 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 you started driving at a very, very early age. Would you care to disclose yeah. so what age you started farm. grappling with Land Rover gearboxes with? Yeah, yeah. And you learn pretty quick because if you don't learn, you don't make forward progress. And if you're not making forward progress in mud, then you've got to walk back to your dad's house and say, Dad, I got the Land Rover stuck again. So uh, I grew up on a farm in Hampshire. Uh, my dad was a farm manager. So we, I had access to a series two, a gray series two Land Rover many, many years before I was old enough to drive. I can't remember exactly, but um, nine, 10, 11, I don't know when I started driving it. And uh, as you do on a farm. Nine, and 10 or 11, wow. And, yeah. yeah. So, and then well, I, I, I inherited that. And then I, so I've always been passionate about Land Rovers. And then my daughters, we were living out here when my daughters were born in Dubai. And uh, I've got pictures of my six-year-old daughter. I, I don't have it for you, so I've got it somewhere. Um, she's driving uh, my then Land Rover Discovery across the desert. And I only realized, somebody sent me the photo, and I realized weeks later that she had her thumbs on the outside of the wheel as she was driving. Oh, bless her. She's absolutely <laughs> learned that. Nobody told her. She's just well, seen at, me driving. At six? She, at yeah, six. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'll try and find the photo, but I... I'm How did sure she even is. reach the pedals or see over the steering no, wheel? No, 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 she was sat, sat on my lap. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> um, true story. Not, about not something that we encourage or condone, by the way. Yes, so in I, 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 the I, desert on flat level ground, yes, in the desert. The way I learned when I was yeah. on the farm. Yeah. So, uh, and it, I, I do encourage it, and I think children should learn to drive at an early age because they're much safer when they get on the road. Oh, so, uh, yeah. And true story. Um, years later, she was quite confident driving, probably 12, 13 years old. We were out in my, um, one of my many classic Range Rovers and we were a bit of patch of ground out the back of where we live. And a, somebody with a Jeep, it was along the Jeep Cherokee, that got crested it was right by the side of the road. So I got out to see what they were doing, but she was driving at that point. And this was a guy with an almost brand new Cherokee, his wife and kids in the car. I had the rope in the car, all the recovery gear. So I said, oh, don't worry about that. I said, we'll get you out. Yeah, we'll come over. I said, uh, so I sort of waved to my daughter and she drove over, pulled up in front of the Jeep and I hitched the, um, I, I walked back to her, I hitched the rope on and I leant in and I said, don't worry, you don't have to do this, but pretend that you are. I said, I'm going to wind this guy up. And I went back to said, right, you ready, mate? And he's staring in through the window. My daughter's like this in, in, the, in the driver's seat. You know, she, she, she's like this with the steering wheel. And he's just like, seriously? Seriously, you're not going to do this? And my daughter's just laughing her head off. So eventually we swapped. So yes. Um, yeah, I've been driving Land Rovers for a long time. My, my daughter's too. So, uh, yeah. yeah, you've had a lot of Land Rover adventures, but also um, you have an airplane connection, an aircraft connection. I can see a book over yes. your left shoulder All there. Of those, so those before, the, before you came out to Dubai, you were doing something with the uh, Royal Aircraft Establishment. Well, when I, when I left school, um, I, uh, I knew I wanted, I wasn't, I was academic, but I, I just wanted to get my hands dirty. I just wasn't ready to go to college and university. So I went and did a fantastic apprenticeship at the RAE Farnborough, uh, where the air show is held. Yeah, yeah. Held. Um, and so I spent five years building airplanes and learning mechanical skills, operating lathes, uh, doing, um, you know, uh, hand tools, uh, making aluminium, crafting aluminium, which has come in useful when you own Land Rovers uh, to use mm. tools and fix the <laughs> end. Um, but it has, and it gave me a fantastic training. And I then went into a career in technical sales. So the technical background that I got at Farnborough was, was fantastic. And I still, I think of the place very fondly. And I did a trip years ago with Bentley um, oh. and they flew us into Heathrow, took us on a minibus and they said, oh, we're going to another airfield and we drive flying from here to Croatia. And I realized we were going to Farnborough and we yeah. got in a, bit, uh, a big charter jet and we taxied past all the hangars where I used to work. And it was oh one of God. the best trips I ever did because I was like, oh <laughs> my God, I remember this place. It was so nice. And you tried, you tried flying for a bit, didn't you? I, I did, yes. When I was in my mid-twenties, I uh, moved to the States for 18 months. with oh, right, right. Company. And there was an airfield, Peter O'Knight Airfield in Tampa. And uh, I learned to fly uh, there. Um, loved it. Absolutely loved it. But uh, it was very cheap to, to fly in America. Yeah, and, it is, yeah. Uh, easy to do. And no landing fees wherever you flew. Right. I'd get up in the morning, look at the weather, go to the airport, and get up and fly to Vero Beach or fly towards the Keys, Florida yeah. Keys. As a student, you know, and, and touch down, touch and goes. And lots of, I loved it, absolutely loved it. But then I moved back to the UK um, and it was something like seven times the price per hour to fly. You, I was at Blackbush, so you took off, you were in Heathrow's airspace, you went left, you were in military airspace, you went right, you were in Farnborough's airspace, you went south, you were Southampton's airspace. And it was no fun. 
And I, I moved out to Dubai not long after that. So I can fly. I, I go back to the UK infrequently and I've got a mate who flies aerobatics, Simon. So we, we go flying sometimes. So I do enjoy oh, that's it. Pretty yeah, cool. I, I, that's like, pretty I love cool. planes. Wow, planes. you should you should let me know next time you're doing that. I did once take an hour because you know, as you know, it's expensive here, but a friend of mine wanted to he was toying with the idea of doing uh, flying. Yeah. Uh, but he wanted somebody to go with him. So we both went and we yeah. did an hour's introductory yeah. lesson. And that was a real laugh because, you know, when they, they take off and then they give you the controls and then yeah. you get to yeah. actually feel what it's like to fly an airplane. Yeah. It's extraordinary. But yeah, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. We fly at White Waltham, which I think is not too far from you. It's, uh, you're, you're, you're which part? North East? I'm not, North not, 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 not West London. Right. So, so yeah. White Waltham is North East London. So uh, I'll let you know when we're, we're flying out there. You can pop over for lunch and we'll... Uh, That'd be cool. That'd be cool. So how did you end up in Dubai then? Because you started a company uh, uh, for this, this, to, well, this was to do with the food packaging and stuff that you were talking about earlier, which is Altica? Yeah, Altica, right? Altica, Altica yeah. packaging. Thanks for the plug, yes, for all your packaging requirements in the Middle East. Yes. Um, <laughs> we'll put well, the link so below. We'll put the, you send me the links. We'll put it in the description. Altica.com. No. Yeah. Do that. Um, so, um, so as I was like 21, I was an aircraft engineer, but I thought there's more to life. I want to get out and do this stuff. I always thought I could sell. Um, I was going out with a girl whose father had made a very nice life for himself and he was in um, building, sale, building material sales. And we, we got chatting, he said, Tim, you could talk the hind legs off a donkey, you should get into sales. <laughs> and he was right on both counts. Um, so I, I left. I did the, did the donkey know? Did the donkey know about this? <laughs> uh, there's a joke in there about an ass, but I'm, not, I'm just not gonna tell it. I'm just not, no, this is, the, this is a, a, a public viewing. Family um, friendly YouTube uh, channel, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And bizarrely, I actually went, I got my sales training in a publishing company. I was actually selling advertising in magazines uh, for the Engineer magazine, which is a fantastic publication. Um, but I discovered two things. One, I loved selling. And two, I hated selling advertising in magazines. Yeah, that's <laughs> so not I, the easiest gig in the world, let's be honest. It's not. And, uh, there are those that are good at it and they love yeah. it and I, I, just, I just couldn't. So, and so this is important. You'll, we'll get to this in a minute. I, I left and for a year. I worked for my father's business. And he had a turf laying company. You know, when you buy a new house and you, you, you want an instant garden, you, you ring up a turf company and they deliver and we laid, laid the lawn. Well, I did that for a year and that taught me a lot. It was good because I later had my own business, but I learned all about advertising, turning up on time, promises to customers, doing quotes on time. You know, it was good grounding, but it wasn't what I really wanted to do for the rest of my life. But remember that I was laying turf for a living. Okay, we'll come to yeah. that. <laughs> Um, I then got a job with a packaging machinery company, bizarrely, uh, that was early, that was for a year. And then I got offered a job which would involve selling uh, paint and ink test equipment, but ultimately living in Tampa, Florida. By then I was playing American football. I was passionate about it. I love it. I'm, uh, yeah, it's, I owe do you like understand, do you, do you understand America? Nobody, I can't understand American yeah. football. <laughs> well. They, Come they and go sit for, and they, watch a game with me. They, I, I played they, for they, ten years, mate. I, I, I'd like they, to think they, I do understand it. Whenever I've tried to watch it, they, they move it for they move for like ten seconds and then they stop and then they have a, a meeting again, don't they? That's like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've heard various descriptions of it. The best description is that it's like playing chess with bulldozers. Okay, My it's God. a very <laughs> it's a very tactical game sport. Uh, I absolutely loved it because I was quite athletic. I wasn't immensely strong, but I was athletic and, and you know strongish. And it absolutely suited me. Uh, I loved the tactics. I loved, and I loved the cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately, oh, partic one, so. particularly. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so, did you, so, did you yeah. play? Did, so, did you play rugby as well then? I, I did at school, but uh, yeah. the CDs. I yeah. started wearing glasses at about 13, 14. You can't play rugby, and and I was like, I wanted to be in the mix. You can't when you're wearing glasses. I didn't oh, have right. contacts in there. I just couldn't afford them. So. So I kind of ducked out and I was more into athletics. So right, right. anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. really meandering. So <laughs> I, I, wandered, I wandered all around and I ended up working for a company selling paint test equipment in um, ultimately in Florida and then back in the UK. Um, so the point I wanted to make was, I don't think there are many people on planet earth who can genuinely claim this. My career path went from watching grass grow to watching paint dry, technically, <laughs> genuinely. Um, so, and, and I was qualified in both of those things. But, you do, but, you're, but you're doing yourself a giant uh, disservice there because you had a very exciting uh, career. And once you ended up in Dubai, because you got involved into where, you know, Dubai is obviously, you know, as yeah. I've said before in some of these discussions that we've had with some of my Dubai buddies, Dubai is a place of opportunities. There's lots of stuff Absolutely. that you can get into and do, which yeah. maybe in other parts of the world you'd never really get Absolutely. into. 
And over in yeah, Dubai, so you've been able to get into motorsports, you've done marshalling, yeah. you've been a co-driver. I mean, tell me, how did you yeah. get into all of that stuff? Well, just to finish the story, I basically, I went to, a, with the old company, I went to an exhibition in Iran, needed a screwdriver to put my stand up, met a guy, <laughs> and 29 years later, that guy is still my business partner, Ian, wow. and through him, I got a job in Dubai, and that's how I ended up here. Um, so I, I moved out here to work for a company selling printing equipment, it te- um, industrial printing equipment. Mm. And um, once I was here, as you say, it's a land of opportunity. And I was yeah. just focused on work. The first five years, really, I wasn't doing anything else. There was no American football out here, so I had to yeah. quit that. Uh, there is now. Um, and then I went to Australia. I set up their business in Australia. And then one day, my now business partner rang me up. He said, Tim, my business is going okay, but I'm a one-man band. I really want to work with you. We work so well together. I said, get your backside back to Dubai and come and work with me. So I moved back in 99 and uh, started, threw myself into work. And within a few years, we had met a friend, Mark Powell, who had a rally team. Now, I've always been a motorsport guy. I enjoy it. But he was rallying a defender, a long wheelbase defender. And I've sent you some pictures. Um, after a couple of years working with him uh, on the team, uh, his co-driver left. I had a go at it, discovered I could do it. And within my sixth race with the team, I was lined up against uh, Stefan Peter Hansel, Bruno Sabi, wow. uh, Jutta Kleinschmidt, Masuoka. And we were in the UAE Desert Challenge. And wow. I was lined up against works BMWs and works Mitsubishis. And I was sat there going, what am I doing here? It's like, I don't belong now, here. Now, we, now but, I, I want to I paint a picture here because there's two aspects. There's two things that you've jumped into there. First of all, the concept of co-driving particularly in mm. the desert. Now, I did, yeah. I did an event with Mini once where I got an insight. I got some training yeah. and I got some insight. And I realized yeah. just how incredibly difficult it is, the co-driving yeah. aspect of it, you know, yeah. especially when you're in the desert. I mean, and yeah. just to keep up with it and everything, I yeah. found that very difficult. Yeah. And the second yeah. aspect yeah. is I think people, I think it's very hard for a lot of people to understand just how grueling and dangerous, yeah. and I'm sure we'll come to that, the desert challenge is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I just found that I had a knack for it. Um, I'd never done road rallies. I hadn't co-driven in road rallies. I'd been driving in the desert by then for 10, 15 years. I had the pace notes put in front of me. The pace notes for a desert rally, the, the, the Dakar and, and rallies like that. You know, in a, a, when you see a road rally, you, the, the co-driver is constantly screaming, you know, it's 200 yards left, yeah. 300 flat right, into a, into a bridge, third gear, don't cut, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's every second, yeah? And I, I, I'm stunned by the guys that do road co-driving. Um, in the desert, you have got a bit more time between the calls, sometimes kilometers. But what you're doing is, um, once you said, you, you give the guy a bearing, you give the driver, they have a compass, yeah. uh, and your base notes has a compass bearing. And you say cap, it's all in French, so it's cap 10 or yes, cap 20, yes. 70. Yeah. He steers that heading. And we were never right at the front of the pack, although we get there. Um, so you follow genu- genuinely, je- generally following somebody's tracks. But you've got to make the calls when you get to the sand dunes. And so what we, we had a system, and basically the driver, Mark, would drive the next 50 meters in front of us. That's what he was utterly focused yeah. on, flat out. I was looking between 50 meters and 500 meters ahead. I knew roughly where we were going, and I would say, next bowl, because you dip into bowls and you come up over crests, next bowl, exit right, then exit left. And as we would drop into a bowl, he's looking at what's down the bottom, and I'm looking at what's at the top. And so I would call where the safest exit was, or the easiest exit, or the exit that would best suit where we yeah. were going. And we just discovered, we were a good team, and we, we, yeah. we just, we had cracked, and, yeah. um, um, and because we both had experience, and, and now our first ever race, my, sorry, my first ever race, not Mark's, we finished seventh overall. We had Works BMWs behind us, Works Mitsubishi. Bruno Sabi, I will never forget, Bruno Sabi came up to us. Lent, we had been racing with him one day through yeah. the dunes, left and right. And um, he leant in the, in the window of the, the, the Land Rover and he said, guys, thank you. It's been a pleasure. He said, wow. I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot wow. following you. Wow. And, and he walked away and Mark and I look at each other. And he, was that Bruno Sabi? Said, yes, it was. Oh, Did he my just God. <laughs> <laughs> because these guys are obviously awesome, but yeah. they a lot of them didn't have desert experience, and they yeah. would come out to the desert challenge, and they would it would be their first sand driving, and we would do five days. You're doing two and a half thousand five hundred kilometers a day, eight, nine, ten hours in the car. Sometimes you get stuck, you dehydrate, you get it. It was I loved every second of it. I, it was awesome. I, it really, really was good experience. Yeah. And this, uh, and this, this, this was Team Saluki, was it? This was Team Saluki. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. was Team Saluki. Uh, we did three years with the Land Rover Defender. 
uh, which was sold to the Canadian guys who went and did the Baja 1000 in it. And then uh, we bought, or Mark bought the, um, the fast and speed buggy, which, right, yes. pictures, which yeah. was phenomenal. Two wheel yeah. drive, yeah. but one more thing for the co-driver to do as well as navigate and operate the trip meter and talk to the driver and deal with it. Then I had to operate the tires. So you deflate ah. and inflate on the car. Oh, wow. Um, because you're two wheel drive, um, yeah. you have the advantage, you're allowed tire deflation. You don't have that on the other categories, you know. Um, so as well as doing the navigation, you're like, okay, we're coming onto a gatch track, hard surface, yeah. up with the tires. And you're, you're still co-driving, but you're holding the buttons up to inflate the tires. Right, right. Looking at them. My God. Uh, it, I tell you, it's, 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 a, it's a lot of respect for that. Because like I said, I mean, I had a very, very tiny glimpse into it. And I was absolutely yeah. flabbergasted about it. Now, yeah. of course, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the dangers of the desert <laughs> challenge. And obviously, yeah. you know, there, there, are, there are the obvious dangers, such as the heat and the dust, the dehydration. Yeah. But yeah. obviously, you're going at high speeds, and, and there, are, yeah. there are, can be some spectacular crashes. Yes, there can be. I didn't have a spectacular. Mark had, in previous year, um, a wheel came off while they were doing 160 kilometers an hour. Wow. And if you, the braking effect of sand is really quite impressive when you have no wheel and you only have a disc. And they went end over end over end over end six, seven Gosh. times, destroyed the car. And I actually first met Mark when he was rebuilding it. But... You have safety cages, you have harnesses, you wear, you wear helmets, you're wearing neck, uh, neck braces, and they walked away from it. Um, what happened to me, uh, the, I left uh, Team Saluki, went to Team FJ, the, the FJ yeah. Cruiser I sent you yeah. a picture. That, that was the vehicle, which I'm not very fond of. Um, <laughs> it wasn't an accident. We, we came over a large crest. Uh, it was my fifth international race, the Desert Challenge. And uh, I don't know quite what happened. My harness was not as tight as it should have been. And I really don't understand why, because I'd raced for years at that point. And we went up and I flout myself float and we came down really heavy. It was only about a meter and a half, two meter drop maybe. It was, it was a big, decent drop. And um, I came down and my spine bottomed out and um, I, I broke my back, oh my God. Uh, which was not pleasant. I don't recommend it. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the end of our rally. That was, I was out of the car. I, I got myself out of the car. Um, wow. I, I rolled out of the car. No, well I was, my back was compressed at the back and I was oh, sitting on it and it was excruciating. And I knew I wanted to curl up in a ball and I couldn't do that in the car. So I actually rolled out of the car with a broken back. I don't recommend it. Um, but it, as it happens, it was the right thing to do. And I curled up and I was fine. I was helicoptered out seven hours on a backboard, taken to hospital, big operation. Uh, I'll name him again. Dr. Johannes Veltzman is the guy who put me back on my feet. Bless him. Uh, we did an operation called kyphoplasty. And that was uh, 12 years ago. And yeah. apart from the odd twinge every now and then, I walked out of the hospital five days later, gingerly. Just five days later? Yeah, wow. amazing. I, I got hurt wow. at about two, two o'clock on the Monday. Yeah, Monday, and I walked out at midday on the Friday. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. That's amazing. And then, yeah. and then how long in recovery, though? How long you know, did, did it sort of take? I had to wear a brace, which basically was a plate that came up here and then around my, went around my back and then braces down, down to just the wow. well, top of my bits. Um, and so I basically couldn't bend. So I had to walk around like this because yeah. I, I, I couldn't bend forwards. And I shot, actually, this, hang on. This book it was my first air show book that I shot as a photographer and I was writing wow. the book. And I did that book. I was walking around the airfield for three days with camera packs in this brace. Oh my goodness. And um, because it was Alain, it was a military airfield. Yeah, and yeah. the first day I got there, they check your bags and then you have to walk through the metal detector. And I'm like, <laughs> guys, you, you, you need to see this. And I took my shirt off and they're like, what? <laughs> um, and after that, I would walk in and they'd see me and they'd go, you can just go through. It's all right. Uh, we know. So oh, well, I had three months in that, um, and then uh, I touch wood. I've been I've been good ever since. No, that's good so, to hear. So since so since then, obviously that was the rallying done, but that didn't stop you get keeping yeah. involved in cars and motorsports and stuff, did it? No, no. Well, I, I I rejoined the same team the following year as the team manager. We went and we won first in class in the same race. Um, I was always going to be involved. Then I um, actually I used the advantage the, the situation of my advantage. I told my wife in the hospital that if I was going to quit rallying, I was going to take up photography and I was going to need a lot of camera gear. She was so happy that I was quitting rallying after breaking my back yeah. that I had carte blanche to buy all my camera gear. <laughs> right? And I went yeah. out and I bought and that, and that, camera gear. And that stuff ain't cheap, as we know. That, oh my goodness. Yeah. Not the stuff I was buying, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
um, so I went out and I, I started shooting um, air shows, but also yeah. desert rallies, and I, yeah. I became yeah. the official photographer to some of the desert rallies. But, but you also, you've been doing some precision driving as well, including working yeah. on some Hollywood movies. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, I get, blimey, I've, I've done some stuff. I'm like, um, yeah. So uh, that was a little Listen, listen one of these, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name them. I'm going to name them, because it's Syriana. Oh, my yeah. goodness. My first, wow. My first one. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Mission Impossible 4, which I remember seeing the yes. filming of. That's the one where you went up the yes. Burj Khalifa, isn't it? And then uh, Fast and Furious 7. <laughs> I, believe, I believe Tom Cruise went up the Burj Khalifa, so to speak. Yeah. No, he did. No, he did. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. I saw a, a, a structure that was in, there was a place I used to shoot near Maidan. And they, City. Yeah. No, this was near Maidan. I used to shoot around there and they'd actually built yeah. a fake bridge and all of this. I remember driving around there and parking up and watching. Eventually, a production assistant came up to me and said, are you going to move? Because we're filming. I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I still, and I don't, I don't know this, but I still reckon that shot where the, he said, and it was all, you know, oh, here's a picture of Tom Cruise actually hanging off the Burj Khalifa. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Studio City is just down the road from me and you know yeah. Studio City. Yeah. And I was driving, would be around there at that time, and there was about a three-story yeah. reproduction of the side of the Burj Khalifa yeah, yeah. to a degree. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I never saw anybody shooting there, but yeah. it disappeared after they left. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not, I'm not convinced that they actually filmed it on the Burj I still think that they shot it there. No, no, the they, no, no I, I have to disagree. They did use the, they, no, they did have a replica. Well, they, and they, did, yeah, they did have a replica and they did use it for close-ups and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. the way that we know, because of the wonders of social media, the way that we know they shot on the Burj Khalifa was because all the tourists on Burj Khalifa shot, were posting images uh -huh. at the time. I remember right. seeing them and they were tagging okay. Tom Cruise. Like, I mean, obviously yes. he was from some distance away, but as far as you could tell, yeah. it looked like it yeah. was Tom Cruise. So that's quite extraordinary. So how did you get, yeah. so the only other person that I've done an interview with on these things with, uh, who's been involved in movies and car stunts Alex. and stuff like that was Alex. Yeah, Alex Kappa yeah. Murdoch, yeah. I've so, done, I've, yeah, I've done quite a few shoots with Alex. Um, we've done a lot of adverts. Um, the film work, she did, um, oh, was it City of, what was the, 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 the Dubai film? Oh, yeah, City of, City of Dreams. That's the one that she crashed the Range Rover in. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was asked to do that one, but it was only a few months after I'd had my accident. Oh, I was right. Still in the race, and I was like a bit, because I knew we had to crash. It's yeah. the only event that we've ever done. We had to deliberately crash the cars. Yeah. And I was a bit wary about it. And in the end, I thought, you know, yeah. not, not so soon after the injury. No, no fair um, enough. So yeah. I didn't do that with Alex, but I've, I've done a lot of shoots with Alex for a lot of adverts. Um, yeah. A lot of Toyota adverts, it seems, yeah. and BMW, yeah. all sorts. So, yeah. so it's not so what, just so, films. So what was the driving that you did for these movies then? Was there anything okay. that we'd see on screen? <laughs> yeah. uh, Siriana, you can see me on screen uh -huh. for three quarters of a second. Uh -huh. uh, if you watch the shot where it says Marbella, and then uh -huh. all these cars pull into a car park, it's not Marbella, it's the one and only Royal Mirage. <laughs> all the cars have got Spanish plates on, and you will see a gentleman walk up to the car as it arrives at the hotel, open the door of the Ferrari and the driver gets out and he drives, the valet parker drives it away. Right. Watch very closely for the guy that gets in the Ferrari. That's all I'm saying. All right. <laughs> um, so that, that was my first experience and it was, really was just car park driving. But I discovered that you have to be six hours on set for yeah. a shot that lasts eight seconds, yeah? If you're lucky. Um, the next one was, mm, was not Mission Impossible. It was, uh, yes, the, the next one was Mission Impossible 4. Much the same, funnily enough, I was really only working in the forecourt of a hotel, moving vehicles around. But the wonderful thing was they, the, the place was full of exotic Lambos and the one-off yeah. Porsches and, and unique vehicles, all purple and green and lime and yellow. And the director, we, we kept moving vehicles. My job was to move the vehicles around safely. So they had someone they could trust with all these high-performance vehicles. Yeah. And in the end, he, he, he's turned and he pointed, my car was there, my XF, my Jag XF. And he said, uh, whose dull gray car is that? He says, put that in the shot. Because it didn't distract from all the others. Uh, uh, so if you, watch, if you watch carefully as um, Tom Cruise turns into, it's supposed to be a Mumbai party. Oh, yes, 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 yes. The, he's, he's, uh, he's in the BMW i concept, thing, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. I can tell you about that as well. Glass yeah. fiber and, and yeah. a mini engine, you know. Yes. Uh, but power of yeah. movies, right? Um, and so if you watch, as he goes up the ramp into the hotel, I think there's a, I think it's a Aston Martin, then my Jag, then a big BMW in front of me. Yeah. And you can see my Jag, the gray Jag on the right. True story. And I pointed this, uh, uh, so we, we spent six, seven, eight hours filming that shot. And again, it lasts about eight seconds. 
Um, and there were hundreds of people there. They were all over from Hollywood. They're all staying at five star hotels and four star. And we finished the shot and we were told, you know, this is in India. Uh, all the cars had Indian plates on, on num false number plates on my car and everybody else's. And we'd done the whole shot and they cut. And we, we, I actually met Tom Cruise and we were chatting about an AC Cobra that I was stood next to. And um, is, is he really yeah. into his cars? He's really into his cars, isn't he? True, true story. So I invited a mate, Tom, who had a beautiful yeah. replica, a, another Tom, beautiful replica AC Cobra that he had built. Tom is a six foot five. A380 pilot, right? Oh. Tom, they didn't use Tom's car in the end, so he was a bit, you know, he was yeah. sad about that. But, um, and he, he said, oh, and I didn't even meet Tom Cruise, you know, it was all yeah. been a bit of a cop out today. I said, do you want to meet him? And he was stood yeah. 200 yards away chatting to the director. I said, well, okay, how are you, Tim, going to arrange to meet for, I said, go and get your Cobra, pull up here, rev the engine. I said, I will bet, because Tom Cruise is utterly a car guy. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I'll bet he comes down to have a look at this car. He's like, oh, you're full of it. He went off, he got his car, he drove down, and I said, he read the engine, and I was looking at him, and he turned, and he was looking, and his eyes lit up. I said, he's coming down, isn't he? Goes, yes. <laughs> Brilliant. And oh, Tom Cruise walked down, as I thought he would. He, and he, was, he straight away, is it a replica, is it a rebuild, you know, chat, chat, chat. And Tom asked for a, my friend Tom asked for a photo. And he said, yeah, yeah, sure. Now, bear in mind, Tom was sat in the cobra, right? yeah. and he opened the door, and he got out, and he's six foot five, and Tom Cruise went, <laughs> Damn it, could you be any taller? <laughs> so yeah. We had to get Tom to sit back in the Cobra so I could take a photograph. Tom yeah. did not want the picture taken. Next no, he is, he is a bit vertically challenged, isn't he? Yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but, I want to get on. I, we, we're running out the clock, as I always end up doing on oh. these things. But I can't let you go without talking about your, your next project that has kind of been yeah. in stasis for a while, hasn't it? You know, this is... Yeah. <laughs> Tell us yeah. about okay. this. Tim, so, Tim's Travel Trucks dot, dot com, right? Is that what? Or, Tim, or, Tim's Travel Truck dot rocks. We'll, dot we'll rocks. Yeah. yeah. So years ago, I met several people who've driven around the world, or rode, rode bikes around the world. Just met them coming through Dubai and the like. Got to know them, and I was heading towards what I thought would be a slightly earlier retirement than has happened. And I said, you know what? I love driving. I love photography. I love travel. I like writing. I can put together a decent video and blog or if I want to. Do you know what? I'm going to travel the world. And so I, business was doing quite well in those days. And I saved quite a lot of money. And I spent five years planning it and designing it. And I had custom built for me a six by six sprinter chassis with a uh, cabin on the back, which was built in Ukraine, of all places. And um, it was my ticket to travel the world. And it was delivered in early 2017. The plan was to head off shortly thereafter. April the 1st was the day I was going to go. Yeah. It seemed like a good day. But uh, life got in the way. Um, business, for various reasons, we won't go into, for various reasons, uh, I decided to stay at the business. The chassis wasn't quite right when it was first built, and that was a problem, so I couldn't leave you had a, You had a couple of teething problems, I remember, with it. Yeah, I did. There, was, there were transmission and rear axle problems. And it, mm -hmm. I think it was a Friday afternoon job. To be fair to the manufacturer, Oberinja, they came back, they put it right. It, it took a while because it was difficult. We were working remotely. There was one in the country, sorry, two in the country, but, and I had one of them. Um, but we got it fixed, bless them. They gave me spare gearbox, spare transmission as, a, as an apology. Uh, it's all been fixed. But by then, I decided I had to stay in the country and help to put the company back on its feet because yeah. we'd had a couple of rough years. So I'm still sitting in Dubai and my vehicle is sat outside my office and every day reminds me that I'm yeah. still sitting in Dubai. So, so the plan so is, it, is... So is it going to happen? Yeah, it has to happen. Otherwise, right. my wife's going to kill me for buying the truck. <laughs> so it's either... <laughs> it it's so, so the options are either death or adventure around the world. Yeah, I, I think... Death yeah. Or glory. Yeah. Death or glory. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the, I'll drive out into Saudi, catch the ferry to Sudan. And then basically all the way down the east coast of Africa, around the bottom, up the west coast, round through, sorry, that way, round through uh, West Africa, into Morocco, Spain, up to the UK, ship it to the south of Argentina and drive Argentina to Alaska. That's the plan. That sounds absolutely awesome. That'll be absolutely yeah. awesome. Cool. All right. So, I, so just remind, I mean, I'll put all the links below, but just tell people what's the best way of getting or finding you if they want to. Oh, come to my office because I'm working there these days. Um, <laughs> right, so uh, I meant well, in a virtual, in a virtual sense, in a virtual sense, in, in a virtual online sense, sense yeah. uh, yeah. through Tim's Travel Truck dot rocks, I guess. Okay. Um, although I have to say, it's not really been kept up to date because I'm in yeah. traveling. So 
apologies to anybody who goes there. It's a nice site, but it's not up to date. Yeah. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, it's, it's my business email and, and my, yeah. my Facebook page. Uh, Tim's Travel Truck has a Facebook page. That's maybe the easiest way. I'll give you that. Are you, so are, you, and are you still doing writing and stuff? Or are you still doing motorsport stuff? Or Yeah, um, the writing, as you know, I mean, the yeah, industry. It's, not, it's uh, not great over there. I do know uh, that, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it. So I was writing for Wheels Magazine yeah. in, in areas we were competing with you. But yeah. um, I've not written for that magazine for nearly the best part of the year, sadly. Uh, um, but, but I'm keeping busy with the photography. So I still go out and photograph motorsport events. And I hang around racetracks and just see if there's anything interesting going on. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool, cool, man. Oh, Tim, it has been absolutely awesome to catch up with you once again. And, and I hope that somehow soon we'll be on a trip again together because it's always absolutely hilarious to share a car with you. It really is. You just keep me in stitches the whole time. And I really, really yeah. miss that. <laughs> As I said, it's, it's, it's mutual and I miss it too, mate. So we'll listen, best of luck to you. Uh, and, and I didn't ask, how are you and your family coping with, with, with what's going all on? All good, man. All good, man. You know, I live a virtual life and everybody follows me. So you see what well, I'm always up to. But, with, you know, yeah. we're surviving. In this year, the objective is to survive the year. That's, that's what yeah. it's all about. Isn't it? yeah. Absolutely. Cool, Absolutely. man. Thanks so much for well, doing this. Good luck to you, mate. And we'll Love speak again soon. You. Take care. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Wow. Talking AC Cobras with Tom Cruise. I wasn't, honestly, I wasn't actually expecting the conversation to go in that direction, but that is some heavy name dropping going on right there. But that was pretty cool, don't you think? I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments above, below, elsewhere, wherever you're watching this. Uh, I hope that you're watching this on youtube.com forward slash brown car guy. And if you are, make sure that you are subscribing and make sure you hit that bell notification icon so that you get updates every time I upload these videos and of course check out my reviews and other great content that I've also got on the channel meanwhile make sure that you're following me on social media just search for hashtag brown the car guy as you can see on my hat there that's on Instagram Twitter Facebook and of course subscribe to browncarguy.com you can see it there on the screen behind me if you enjoy these videos and if you can then please consider supporting me just go to patreon.com forward slash shazad shake and there you'll also find some goodies and some exclusive content let me know what you thought of that stuff if you can't, then no worries. Please continue to like, comment, share, subscribe, all the rest of it. That's much appreciated. And many, many thanks for doing that. Many thanks for joining me in this episode. And I will see you again soon in the next one.